Uh, welcome along to the panel discussion, talking about what our hill country is going to look like in 2040. I'm delighted to welcome up our chairman, um, Richard Green. It has taken us three years to get Richard to chair one of these sessions, but he ran out of excuses, which I was delighted about. So I'll hand over to Richard. Those that don't know me, which will be 95% of you, but I had a farming, farm consultancy background many years, and then I actually was involved in the seed industry for another decade of my life, which was a lot of fun, and building international um, markets and then building a business. And um, now involved in uh, our own farming businesses, dairy, honey actually, so I'll be interested in Dan and Mandy talking later on, and also aged care, retirement villages, but also sit on a number of um, different large-scale um, advisory boards, farmer advisory boards, which I really enjoy, and also on Agmart and just step, Agmart Trust and just stepped off far. So quite involved across the whole industry and really passionate about the opportunities in this industry and the, the opportunities we have to think differently and do different things going forward. So I think that's what today is about. This is focused on the visions and opportunities for the hill country farming in 2040. And why 2040? Because it's actually only 22 years away which is close enough that most of us can think we'll be there in our farming careers still, but it's far enough away that we know that a lot of things are going to really change between, before, between now and then. If you take exclude the South Island extensive high country, there's still about 10 million hectares of pastoral farming in New Zealand. And just over half of that, about 5.4 million hectares, is actually hill country. And that hill country, so it's a huge tract of land, that hill country has um, gross incomes of between $500 and $1,000 a hectare. So if you think about the contribution of that to the national economy, it's major. But probably one of the real keys to me is how many rural communities, hundreds of rural communities, that that sustains, and regional economies. And it actually is the basis of a lot of our culture and the way of life that we have in New Zealand. So hill country farming systems are exceptionally important. I think the other thing we all know, just to set the scene, but change has been a constant in everyone in this room's life. And I think farmers have always adapted and they've changed as the rules of, ga rules of the game have changed and we've actually been able to understand the opportunities. I think so change is nothing new, but I think one of the things that I see at the moment is some of the incremental low-risk change that we've had in the past I don't think is going to get us where we need to get to. I actually see the change we're now faced with going forward is, is more what I call exponential, but it's bigger. The risks are greater because of that, but also the opportunities are also a lot bigger. But the caveat is we have to execute well and we have to do it right, or otherwise we spat out. So there's some big risks, but big opportunities are going to come out of it. And hopefully that's going to come out of the session. But Abraham Lincoln apparently reportedly said, the best way to predict your future is to actually create it. And the first step before, this is my view, the first step before you can create the future, you have to actually be able to visualise it. So I've been really fortunate, I've looked at a lot of different businesses, and I've actually seen the real power and value that have, comes from having a crisp and clear vision that you're driving your business towards, towards. So without a vision, you're like a ship without a rudder and you're in danger of really drifting aimlessly. So a clear vision to me provides the clarity needed to actually know what actions we've got to take to drive our businesses forward. So to help us get our vision quite clear, we're fortunate to have four fantastic people on the panel, all who come from different backgrounds, but they're here to help really stretch our thinking and give us some insights and some ideas on what this future will look like for hill country farming. <coughs> Now, I've asked them to be really bold and really provocative when they articulate their vision, to really stimulate all of our thinking. So what's going to happen, the way we're going to work it is each of these panel members is going to come forward and they're actually going to introduce themselves because we're really short on time. We've only got an hour. And they're going to spend three to four minutes outlining their vision. And then when you've heard from them, we're actually going to open it up for some really good questions. And I want those questions to be quite high level. We've got to absolutely understand that vision before we work out the pathway to get there. So the challenge I want all of you while you, like you're listening to them is really keep an open mind and try and stop yourself from defending the status quo because the opportunities are going to come to those that are brave and the other, those that are prepared to embrace change. Okay? 
So we're going to kick off with Guy Salmon. Thank you, Richard, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted to be invited here. I'm an environmentalist, one of those dreaded creatures. Um, I uh, lead a little group called Ecologic, which essentially is a think tank which supports the environment movement with ideas. Um, uh, I also uh, persuaded my good friend Nick Smith some years ago to set up the Lana Water Forum, a collaborative forum for trying to get environmentalists, iwi and farmers to reach some agreements around how to tackle farming's environmental issues. I've served on the Lana Water Forum for nine years and we just produced our latest report for, for the new government, uh, which was released earlier this week. Um, and I also chair an environmental advisory panel for Landcorp. So I, I'm not completely ignorant of farming issues, but I don't have a farming background. Um, many of my environmental colleagues believe that the problem is that farmers don't care about the environment. And I don't share that view. I think that by and large, and I've been onto a lot of farms now, uh, farmers do care about the environment. There's no real difference between them and other New Zealanders. Um, so when I think about what is the vision for 2040, I'm really thinking about how do we actually deliver on the values that we share. And I think three themes are really important in that regard. We need to be more connected, we need to be more innovative, and we need to be more accountable. Um, when I say, let me deal with each of those in turn, when I say more connected, I'm not talking here about the internet, because in some ways, as you know, if you look at the Stuff website or at Facebook, internet sometimes seems to divide us more than it <laughs> unites us. What I'm talking about are these uh, connections between rural and urban people, connection between farmers and consumers. These things need to be closer than they have been. Many of you will remember the old foot rots flat, what foot rot flats cartoon strip, which kind of portrayed a kind of um, affectionate view of farming. Somehow that ethos has disappeared. This is not good for farmers. It's not good for New Zealand, and also I think it's it's not good for environmentalists. And um, the reason for that is that you get out of touch with farm realities, and you get less influence because you don't really understand farming systems and farmers. And so we've had environmental groups walk out of the Lana Water Forum, we've had them refuse to take part in zone committees in North Canterbury. It's almost like if you're an environmentalist you can kind of uh, sit in a war room in Auckland and, and, and push a button and all farmers will disappear. Um, so somehow this is a problem which we've got to get on top of uh, if we're going to have, if we're going to feel good about our vision for 2040. The second one is more innovative. I don't need to say a lot about that because the sessions already today have been very big on innovation. Just let me say there's two reasons why we need to focus on innovation. One is that, you know, we're now farming within limits. We've got water quality limits. We are about to get limits on climate, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions which affect the climate. And the only way to grow your business within limits is to be more innovative. And secondly, a lot of the things that you're going to be asked to do to cope with limits are going to cost more. And so we also need innovation in terms of earning more for the product, generating new products, new land uses. All of this, you know, environmentalists have a vital interest in farmers being successful in improving their uh, revenues on farm. And that's going to need innovation. And we need to think about how can the public set to help make that happen. And then the third one is more accountable. And, you know, obviously farmers are completely accustomed to being uh, financially accountable. They employ accountants. Um, and uh, you avoid putting yourself into a loss, or at least not too much of one, or for too long. And we need to think about environmental impacts in the same way. We need to have the same kind of accountability for environmental performance that we have long had for, for financial performance. Um, back in 1992, every regional council in New Zealand published a regional policy statement in which they said, we are going to improve water quality. What happened over the next 25 years was a big decline in water quality. And part of the reason for that is a lack of accountability. That's not, uh, that's partly at least because it's difficult to measure, you know? Overseer will give you a number, but you couldn't use it in a court to get a prosecution. Um, 
And there's also been a kind of tradition of farmers being exempt from things. You look at our climate policy. You know, we've gone for 25 years since we signed the Framework Convention on Climate Change with a farmer exemption, um, which is no longer a sustainable thing. Um, and that stems, of course, from that famous incident where tractors were driven up the steps of Parliament by farmers. Um, and on both these issues, climate and water, there's a sort of a sense that farmers aren't really accountable. They set these goals or they agree to these goals, but then they don't deliver. And so accountability is a really important thing. We have to invest in overseer to make sure that we can get it more accurate and more uh, a more reliable basis for validating uh, claims we make about farming and farm products. Um, and we also need to think, I think, about some more collective approach in the hill country. So it may be difficult to hold farmers accountable on an individual property for their production of sediment or their production of nitrogen. But if you took a subcatchment as a whole, and you could put some sensors in the stream at the point where the stream flows into the main river, and you could measure what was coming down the catchment, and farmers in the catchment held themselves collectively accountable for crunching those numbers, that I think would be a huge step toward building confidence that we can deliver on these targets we've set ourselves. Thank you. Well, that got us off to a very good start. John, you've been looking forward to this. John for Stirrell. Good afternoon. My CV is a wee bit shorter than guys, but um, I do have the privilege of managing a sheep and beef hill country farming business for a North Canterbury farming family. We run about 14,000 stock units, over 2,100 hectares. This also involves 400 hectares of well-protected well native bush, which is used for honey production. I like to think we farm as well as possible, but I also know we could be better. I'm not from a family farm, I did not grow up on a farm, and I will more than likely never own a farm. So I'm just going to start with a few projected statistics. Between now and 2040, New Zealand's population would have grown by 750,000 people to reach 5.5 million. 90% will live in an urban area, and 25% will be over the age of 65. The world's population would have grown by 1.6 billion to reach 9.2 billion. Remember these numbers, they're very important. So I'm going to fast forward to 2040. Australia still haven't reclaimed the Bledisloe Cup. <laughs> Winston Peters is on his second and final term as President of the Republic of New Zealand. <laughs> and believe it or not, the hills are still there and you're still farming them, albeit a wee bit differently. The breeding stock, once pushed into the hills by intensive dairy farming and now dribbling back down, squeezed by forestry and carbon farming. Generations before you would have talked of wool paying the wage and fertiliser bill. Carbon is now doing this. To withstand your growing compliance costs and the demands of a growing and ageing population, you've unified your farming businesses, not your land businesses, but your farming businesses, with two, three, four or more like-minded like farming families. These will range from the top of your hill to the bottom of their beach and will be based around biosecurity, trust and the understanding that a good deal is a good deal for everyone, not just you. This will provide you with the scope, scale and diversity needed to protect yourselves from any adverse events and the ability to take your branded products as far down the value chain as possible. Your farming business will finally be competing with your land business for a long-term return. Science has continued to improve and match genetics, plant with animal, and we all provide the ultimate eating experience to the 0.5% of, of the world's population this country can only ever feed. Technology is far too smart for a phone. GPS technology, once large and cumbersome, is now compact and placed in every animal you farm. And it's with this you have recognised your greatest opportunities. The opportunity to prove to your urban voting friends that your environmental practices are top notch and that the virtual fences that now exist keep your livestock out of the sensitive areas that seem to affect their way of life, that your fertiliser and chemical placement is exact. The opportunity to sell this complete story to the niche market of the world, not just the hill country but the whole industry is targeting. We will have realised that every product we sell must be niche. The days of commodities are gone. Those that haven't accepted this are gone with them, engulfed by corporate or carbon farming businesses. And finally, you have recognised that to take your evolved farming business from 2040 to 2060, you will need bold and bright young people with vision and imagination. You realise you will have to reward these people that work in your business, and you will have to help them protect their future as they protect yours. Thank you. 
Thanks, my name's Robin Dines. I'm a farm system scientist with, based with Ag Research out at Lincoln, where I've been for the last 14 odd years. I started my agricultural career graduating with a PhD from the only university to graduate from, of course, being Lincoln. Uh, after my PhD, I spent 15 years in Australia, so I went into the Mediterranean zone of Western Australia, and that's where you challenge yourself uh, to an amazing degree. Coming back to New Zealand and working with farmers in New Zealand has been a real pleasure and a challenge. So my vision when I think to 2040 is one that I see that there's going to be some really big kickers for hill country farming to deal with. They're here already, but it's around animal welfare and it's around the environment, and Guy, I agree, and I think we will be particularly challenged in the areas of sediment and E. coli, and we'll be held accountable like we haven't been previously. I see there's going to be some real upsides. New Zealand and the world will know from the senses that we've already heard about that we really do have a multifunctional landscape, Pablo, and it is going to be even more outstanding than it is now because you're going to embrace the science from organisations like mine and Pablo's to really bring about the kind of change that you as innovators will do. We'll provide you some of the science, you will turn that into the innovation. The web of sensors that, that we've just heard about, there's going to be a couple of really cool things about that, I think. It is going to help business. You are going to have time for two coffees in the morning as you do work at your um, screen to look at what's happening around the farm. And you're not going to have to decide what to have for dinner because the fridge and the freezer will know what's there. You'll get a list and you'll choose the one that looks nicest and whether you feel like a curry or not. And the meat will be cooked to perfection because the sensors will take the idiot out of it. So I think there's some real upsides and, and as my sister a farmer would say, there'll be no longer the 4pm freezer hop as you try to figure out. And that's going to, I think we must not underestimate the power that big data is going to give us. It is already giving us in that smartphone you hold in your hand. Imagine what it's going to be doing in 2040 for how we farm. I like that comment about us being more connected. I think farmers will have more partnerships. They will be sharing their land resource with other people that are going to add wealth to both of those partners. There will be new income streams. Carbon capture is here now, and what it's going to look like for you as farmers to benefit from will be really interesting, and I think there'll be new opportunities. It won't all be about Pinus radiata. It'll be much more varied. And it will come down to People like myself who like to think they've got a small carbon footprint but get on an aeroplane far too many times will be paying you every week for the tree that is on their farm, that, on your farm that, that they are paying for to offset their guilt about the amount of flights they're doing. Wind farms. New Zealand, if we're going to be a carbon neutral economy, will have to have more renewable energy. And I think that wind farms will be part of that. Wind and hydro are our two real assets. I think we're going to always be limited by not having enough sunshine hours in the winter time, and heaven forbid, New Zealand, Canterbury, this has been the best example of that. But you know, we know farmers now make money out of sculpture gardens, so you'll be able to have the tourists coming to see the sculpture garden, which is actually going to be the wind farm, so you'll be getting a double income from that. And so we've already seen the success of things like Manuka Honey now, putting a stake in the ground for science. It was science that, in, that found the, proved the benefit of UMF. Where to next with the kind of products that can come off hill country? And ideally something that can happen at scale. So we know there are alkaloids in plants. We know there's all sorts of secondary compounds in plants. We know that Maori before us have utilised many of those. How are we going to turn them into a profit that stays on your farm? My backup is vodka. You've got to have a backup. And I say that because I have had the uh, Zabruka vodka that comes from the bison grass that's got that herb flavour to it from Poland. It went really well with the raw fillet steak and raw egg we had to eat it with. Uh, it was outstanding. Now that's full of endophytes as well and we do endophyte science better than almost everyone else in the world. So what is the science going to give you as some added value opportunities into the future so that we can go beyond vodka, although vodka might well be good. Now sheep, when I got shoehorned into being on the panel, I was thinking socks, you know, that in 2040 we had to have genuinely sheep that would produce everything, and James is sitting here nodding because he's already got it right. So that the whole world was wearing wool from, wool, wool and socks less than 25 micron. But you know, in the last month, look what's happened with plastics. Who would have thought we would have seen what's going on in the world around plastics right now? 
So my wall researcher colleague said to me this morning, the red carpet has been rolled out. The challenge to us in between now and 2040 is to ha hold hands and go on that carpet together. So I think that there is a future for wool around wool-based polymers that are going to take the place of plastics. And that's going to be money back on the farm to you. In terms of sheep meat, we will be delivering the hyper-personalised nutritional strategy for every single person who chooses to pay for it. And that will be science, again, will be supporting you in those innovations. And I agree with many of the things around the connectedness to market that these opportunities for meat and wool will come from. So wool being the constituent part, again, of this hyper-personalised future with of these, all of these personal products we're going to be demanding. Beef, grinding beef will have to be a byproduct of a whole lot more valuable things, and I think Melissa did a brilliant job of showing us what they look like. And Mike, I'm still working on the beef cow. Maybe she's on the postcard. Mike and I have a long-standing discussion on the booth cow. I want to finish on the one perfect hectare, because on every hill country farm there are some unique opportunities, because you do, almost all of you, have class one land. Pablo and I are setting out on a journey to figure out what might happen without one hectare. It's unique, it could be organic, it's going to be free of pests because it's so far from the next perfect one hectare that there must be opportunities in that we don't now know about. There are things like turmeric. I mean, everyone's seen Richie running up the hill without his turmeric. But what is the next thing that our hyper-personalised nutrition is going to offer? You're the innovators. We've got great science. I think together we've got a really fascinating future. And 2040, bring it on. Thank you. It's about now I... Uh I wished I'd written big print and I had young eyes, because I haven't. <laughs> um, Chris Chamberlain from Banks Peninsula in Port Levy, uh, with my wife Jackie in a partnership. Uh, we've got a sheep and beef property surrounded by the coast, uh, right on Christchurch's back door. And we've also got a complementary block out at Leeston, uh, which is under a pivot irrigation, and we've got some lease land that, that is out there as well. So. Uh, we've got that complementarity. Before Tim Coop asks what's 2040 going to look like, I want to be de delivered down to our local vet club because uh, I want two knees and two new hips if I'm still going to be wandering around the hills. So great concept to have a young guy here because it's the future and, the, and our business needs young blood on it. So what's our business look like at the moment? Well first of all we're an agri-business so profit has to drive it and if we haven't got any profit we can't be sustainable. Should I wish I'd written this bigger? Um, can't, I've got a spotlight in my face. So our businesses are multi, you know, we're farming big landscapes and we're, we're farming animals. What, is it, what does the hill country look like now and what do we need to do? I reckon we need to rebrand ourselves as farmers immediately. We're not in a good space, we're being painted, we're in the minority. What would that rebranding look like? Because what do our businesses look like? Who are we? We're food producers and fibre producers, as we've just been told. Food and fibre, not sheep and beef. So we have to really start to engage with the customer. And I think at a farmer level, we have to be proactive from that and not sit back. We've got to help our processing companies and we've got to align stuff to make that happen. The status quo, the way we're operating at the moment, is not sustainable. We need to differentiate our product. That, that, that includes taste and health benefits. Grow an arable plant that's actually going to put the omega-3s. It's already starting to happen. We have to deliver to the customer what they want is food, that the Melissa's of this world are going to hit that button and buy it on bulk. Our ethics have to be better than none. Our ethics about the way we grow our animal, about the people on our farms, and about the environment. This, we have to differentiate from our competitors. Again, we've got to have a story and a brand, and I think the antibiotic and hormone-free is virtually taken as a granted as far as I'm concerned. That's what we do. We've got to keep building. I know Ireland Green is, and I know Australia is, Origin Green. So we have to get on the game, and we've got to be fast. We've also got to show to the public that we're good custodians of the land. Banks Peninsula is a great model. We are. Biodiversity has increased 18% from 3% when it was all cut down to build Christchurch and that's done within our farming environment but we're not telling it and we are telling it at a grassroots level but no one's hearing it 
and every time we're in a planning process, we're getting bashed back as though we're polluters of the environment. We have to get it, we have to get better at telling that story. The vistas that we have, the views we have to drive all around New Zealand. Why do the tourists come? It's because it looks good. Who's providing those views? Who's providing those landscapes? It's the farming environment to an extent. Let's get a value out of that. You paid overseas for it. We've got to be more proactive and push back. If you want the benefits of being good custodians, and it's going to cost us through what's coming at us, we need a return. We have to be making money out of it. We need to target a vision. And I've written this down, and I'm not a brander, but New Zealand, New Zealand naturally grown, naturally produced foods grown by the world's most trusted farmers. I think that trust word and our accountability are going to be very important going forward, and we have to prove it. So how, how, how would that business look? And all I'm going to do here is waffle on about <laughs> what I can see towards 2040, and it's anyone's guess what will happen. We've got to be efficient. So you've got to look at yourself first. What are you farming? What's your, what's your property? Ours is a dryland steep sheep and beef property. It's summer dry. We can't grow lambs through the summer. So you've got to look at your efficiency and do the best you can. Hill country on Banks Peninsula, I'm using that as an example, but I think we can produce incredibly healthy lambs grown off pasture, free range grown, hardly any drenches, very low pesticide, one of the lowest fertiliser uses per hectare, I'd say, in, in the country. So we've got to promote that story. Let's send that lamb with a passport with all those attributes to a finisher. I'll use John Ridgen as an example. He'll love me for this. But we have to do that. We've got to collaborate with the rest of farmers. So don't try and do something you don't do well. Don't give a product to an overseas customer that is not tasting good, that blots our copybook. We can't be in that game. So we've got to get out there, we've got to collaborate. CP2's come on board, there's a big opportunity. Canterbury lamb from the hills should be finished out there. Why? Because they can do it fast and they can do it to spec. There might be two or three trades. How do we make that work? You don't just stick it on a truck and expect it to be paid well. You've got to follow it out. You've got to go and see John. You've got to say, look, I'm a farmer. I'm an, I'm an, I'm an animal farmer, a stockman. Where can we fit your business? Understand his business. Understand when he's got gaps in his cropping program. The, the FEPs on farmland out there, you can't leave land in fallow. You're going to get whacked on, the, on your plans. So there's a chance for arable farmers to put green crops up to finish our lambs. You have to be proactive to make it happen. The meat companies aren't doing it. I don't think it's their job. We have to get those partnerships going. Then, then help them out. Get out there and help him do the drenching. Don't just ignore them. If he's a busy cropping, find out where you fit, follow the lambs out. Once you've got that going and scale it up, John talked about the same principle, scale it up. Then become a catchment of lambs that go out there. Banks Peninsula as a catchment can go to 10 finishers. Then you might be able to employ a, a specialist block finishing manager. Give them some skin in the game, give them some capital. Make that business work. But the end result always has to be the customer, and we've got to be producing excellence. I think I'm nearly there. One minute. Um, the, other, the other value that I can see that we need to address on lamb quickly, and I can't believe that we're still doing this, is we're selling springborn lambs into the pre-Christmas market, and at the same time there's 12-month-old, slow-growing, useless lambs arriving there and the, the house, housewives eating them as a lamb. Why? Let's, let's seasonal. Why can't we have the, the springborn lamb as being like white bait? or oysters. It's for three months to February. Then for February lamb is a 20 kilo plus lamb grazed on chicory with the omega-3s or the, or the etc. Hill country farming towards the end. How can I help John? Poor land. Give him the carbon. The stuff that's not producing, shut it up, look at it. Put it into conservation. Again, joint venture, share farm it, farm people. If we can help his business to get an offset, Let's look at ours. Let's not try and smash that country that's not that good. The last comment is that um, we have got to accept change and it's moving bloody fast and uh, it's not going to go away. Winston Churchill, I read this when I was younger and it was a good comment, but he said, shake change by the hand before it grabs you by the throat. So I throw the ball back into the court of all you guys 
there are hill country farmers because it's us that have to manage this. Don't wait for someone to do it for you or our industry is threatened. That was excellent. Can, can we actually give all our panellists a big round of applause? Thanks guys, that was very thought provoking stuff. Just, just to kick it off, because um, we've got one microphone, so I want you to be thinking of some really insightful questions that we're all going to learn from. But I've got a few questions from the, um, the Farmers Council actually, pre-prepared questions. And I don't know who I'll throw them through, but the first was to the panellists, can we meet our environmental, increasing environmental compliance costs without government subsidies as, as the rest of our competitors get globally? Perhaps I'll start with Robin and then Guy answering that. I think we can because we will have an offset opportunity associated with some of them. And I don't think we have a choice. I think we've got too small a population to expect that their non-farming population will wear a significant cost. I think the non-farming population would say we've had it so far, this far, and now's the time to start meeting the cost on farm. Now whether they're prepared to pay for the food is the flip side, isn't it? So I think we're going to have to find a way to do it. Part of it may well be through offset. Go on. This is pretty much a live issue that we're about to have this discussion in, on climate change with mm. the government's targets. And they've given us some options, one of which is we take responsibility for all the greenhouse gases, and the other one is, well, another one is that we leave a, an exemption for methane. And um, I saw Robin Grieve has been making the case, I think he got the science a bit wrong, that methane isn't a problem, um, because it's a short-term gas. And, you know, I think the answer is that if you have a short-term gas, then you need a short-term offset, maybe a pine plantation. And if you've got a long-term gas like carbon dioxide, you need a permanent offset for it. So the question then is, well, what does that do to your competitiveness? And you can compare it immediately, I guess, with the tourism industry. Um, Melissa Clark Reynolds and I were both on the government's Green Growth Advisory Group. And there's a graph in our report which shows that um, sheep and beef and uh, tourism are rather similar in terms of relatively high greenhouse gas emissions. And so you've had this kind of argument that um, these, these trade exposed uh, industries that are internationally competing with each other should have an easy ride. But tourism doesn't have an easy ride. It pays the full carbon cost of all its emissions. And the international airlines coming to New Zealand are going to be paying the full marginal cost of their uh, emissions from 2020 onwards. So we're at a point now, I think, where the agriculture industry really needs to step up and pay for its emissions as well. The coalition agreement says, OK, you're only going to pay 5% to start with. And that'll go up gradually over time. But I reckon this is a, quite an opportunity for you to seize onto that and say, yes, we'll do this, and people will notice that. Your consumers will notice it, um, and the rest of New Zealand will notice it. Thanks, Guy. I'm sure there might be a supplementary question at some stage, but perhaps a final question from me, and perhaps, perhaps to John. So you don't even know the question, do you? But don't worry. But what skills will I need to be developing to manage a successful farming business in 2040? And how do I go about developing them? I mean, any panellists can comment. It's not just to John, but perhaps, John, you kick it off. Um, well, I think probably the biggest challenge is just keeping up with the technology, which is moving so quickly. Um, you know, um, exactly where you, where you get those skills, um, I don't know, but, you know, getting young people that are the forefront of that in your business and um, and letting them sort of run with it, I think, is pretty important. Um, and also, you know, I believe in the future, you, you, like we've just talked about, you, you're in line farming operations with other people. You, you know, the relationships you build and understanding how to build and maintain them is crucial. And without that, you're going to have nothing. Yeah. I think you're going to have to be a whole lot better people managers, yeah. whether it's connecting with those people off the farm, likely to be running, John is likely to be running, managing a much bigger 
number of people than he is now, if he's got a whole lot of smaller industries associated mm. with the farm. So you have to be really good. You have to be known as a top employer. And that'll need a whole bunch of skills that many farmers will need to develop much, much further than they have now. Excellent. Ludi, you can be thinking of your question while Chris is answering this one. Yeah, I think, I think the question leads to, is the family-owned farm going to stay? And, uh, you know, we're passionate when there's traditional farms that we make it happen, but I think we do that at the expense of running a profitable business that's sustainable into the long term. We've got to change our thinking on that. I asked my accountant this question yesterday and said, uh, how do we, you know, the corporate farm model, where do we go with that? They're efficient at buying extra land. They're very efficient at having their um, work and safety policy and their employment structures. They also have an environmental planner sit on those boards. So they're getting very robust governance into their business that we are not getting on a farmer. We're head down, ass up, and we've got to be smarter. And we need to be fighting back on the, some of the stuff as far as the carbon and emissions trading go, because I'm willing to accept it, but I am still not convinced that New Zealand is doing doing is justified in paying a tax on what we're doing competing product in the rest of the world. So I think yeah, it's it's we need a skill set that's going to grow. And I think as our energy guy, as our, our transport sector in particular becomes more energy efficient, agriculture could go over fifty percent of our emissions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So questions from the floor. Down. Grant has got one. Okay. Excellent. Then, then there's one up here. Sandra? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, I'm a great production man at the end of the day, and I agree with all the things that have been said up here, but no one's talked about genetic in it, uh, GE or GM, and we could grow a lot more grass and be a lot more productive with those products, but are we going to be allowed to in, in by 2040? Yeah. We've got the science. <coughs> We've got the science and we're trialling it in the US right now. So we've got the science, it becomes a political conversation, it's a conversation for the community as a whole as to whether we're prepared to take that. Because I tell you, if our science delivers in the paddock like it's showing promise, if we don't want it, the rest of the world will want it. But it's a political, it's a construct that now needs the community involvement. I think it's important you also, you need to think about your consumer. You're still feeding that small amount of the world. What do they want? Guy? There's two groups you have to think about. There's the consumer, but there's also the New Zealand, you know, the New Zealanders, and the sort of social license to operate issue. I think there's some change going on in that second space, which is quite important. Um, when you look around the world, the Europeans who initially seem to be saying, gosh, uh, we don't like the look of uh, genetic engineering, they've ended up importing vast quantities of genetically modified soybean into, the, into Europe uh, to feed animals. And those animals are still, you know, the meat is still being eaten. Uh, so uh, some of the more hysterical things are, are dying down. Um, I was convening a group of environmentalists recently to write a report for the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge, and we touched on this issue. There are one or two groups that are run out of Europe that still are paranoid about it. But there's an acknowledgement that this new technology of gene editing is not the same thing as genetic engineering that everyone was protesting about 15 years ago. So I think um, if this issue is handled right, uh, we could get what I think would be the ideal outcome for 10 years down the track, which would be those customers that want to have GE free New Zealand will provide that. Those customers that are willing to have a different kind of product which has a, a GE forage behind it, uh, we will provide that as well. And we'll do that because New Zealanders would have worked through the science and would feel comfortable with it. So I hold that out as a real possibility. Mm -hmm. We just want to avoid getting too polarised about it. Yes, fine. Just a quick one. Um, if the consumer of tomorrow is going to eat a synthetic meat out of a petri dish, I don't think he's going to be that worried about the GM principles. If it's going to um, reduce sprays, reduce fertilisers, and reduce your environmental footprint. So to me, they have to go hand in hand. 
Excellent. Kate, okay, up the front. So I just had a question. Can you explain to us, Guy, in layman's terms, about why the native vegetation that's on our farms at the moment uh, is not being used to offset carbon, or can't currently be used? And is in 40 years, will we be able to? 20 years, sorry? I think there's two reasons. One is that in some cases it hasn't been, the farmers haven't put it forward. And the second reason is that the rules are a bit restrictive in this area. Mm. Um, and we're trying to get that changed. So small bits of vegetation or riparian strips, uh, the Land and Water Forum has just recommended that the government change the rules so that these areas can become eligible. If you've got a mature bit of native forest, it's not going to be adding much carbon. So the trick there is to avoid losing it. Um, if you've got some regenerating scrub land, that will be putting on, like Monaco, you know, that is putting on carbon storage and you ought to be able to earn a credit for it. And I believe that over the next uh, year or two, we should be in a position where you can. Robin, you got anything no. you want to add? No, that's a good summary. Oh, just, no. just, just, oh. just in relation to that. Hang on, get the microphone, sorry. In relation to those offsets that you're talking about, will we be able to do it on our own property? Will we be able to do it ourselves and account for it ourselves? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you'd have to pay a bit to get somebody to certify that you, you know, what the growth rate was and how much carbon was being stored. So there's a little bit of cost there. But if you wanted to do it that way, I don't think there's any reason in principle why you shouldn't be able to. Thank you. Just if you can each say your name too, please. Yeah, Brian Elwood from Low Environmental. Um, we've got Airbnb sharing houses. We've got Uber Eats sharing kitchens and Uber. You reckon we could have Uber farming? So we share your farm, you get a, how would that work in 2040? I think you're directing that at Chris Chamberlain, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll put my hand up and become the next Winston Peters in a dictator. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's, it's a huge change in mindset. Uh, I go back to our, where we're farming in Banks Peninsula and, and the catchment of Port Levy. Should we all have individual titles of land farming in that catchment that feeds into the lower creeks and rivers and the biodiversity that's there and our farming business which we've got a range of weather from 22 inches showing my age at the point up to 60 inches up the top or would that be a wonderful farm farmed together with the eight or nine farmers? Would that be an efficient farm that can shut up the biodiversity, it can farm the carbon, it can look after the water under an ownership structure. I, th I think it would, but it's a shift to actually sink your capital, your land owning business into a company where you all have a share of it and then you run your business of farming outside of it. As a model, we'll be pushed there if we can't maintain profitability at a, at a, at a level when the costs are coming at us. So it's a, it's a tall order, but it would be a discussion that I would you know, I think the banks, I think we need to start to have it. We've got to start collaborating and filling in our risk profiles that we can't achieve. And we've got to be, have trust with the people we're dealing with, but it's got to be a robust business model. I think we see it now a little bit with beehives on farms, and as long as there is an equitable profit sharing, I think has to be part of that. Comes back to my one perfect hectare. You may, as, a, as the landowner, not want to do something with that one perfect hectare, but if you had one of those really innovative young people that was going to put whatever crop into it that was a high value and you both benefited from it, that kind of partnership, I think, will be part of that future. Just, we might move on. I'm just surprised there's no challenges to people's vision, too. I mean, don't just accept it. Be happy to stir them up, but in the middle here. Chris? We're just going around in a circle. 150 years ago, the rivers were the boundaries. Um, currently, I've got a small problem with pine trees. They are our biggest sediment producers. Um, take Tolaga Bay and those poor people. That, that just doesn't seem right to me. Mm. You're addressing that to anyone particularly? Guy, yeah. Can I, I'll give it to Guy in a minute when he can give you an educated answer. I'll give you a basic one. But um, I, again, am afraid of pine trees for the fact that, on the, and it refers to Guy, that if, 
if as soon as a, an industry gets a subsidy slapped around it or, or a grant or whatever you want to call it, um, you've got an unlevel playing field, so the price of land as a competing yen use could go into forestry. So I know of a farm in the Wairapa that three, four farm, farmers were looking at, lovely rolling down country, not steep stuff, that's just sold into a Roger Dickey Forestry Company. I saw it when the forestry boom, boom, blast. So to buy land for sheep and beef, that's where the trees are going to go. It's not going to go in the middle of a dairy farm. And to, to Guy, to add to that question, I'd, I'd just like to ask what the sheep and beef industry on hill country will look like uh, if we lose five to 10, 000, 10 million stock units through pine trees in the next 10 years and what it does for our whole rural communities and our processing industries. Well, just in relation to that last point from Chris, uh, obviously, if you're going to give some land up to forestry, you want to make sure that you've got processing industries which are going to sustain the rural communities. And this comes down to a, a bit of a problem we have with radiata pine, which the questioner from the floor also alluded to, which is that um, it's a low value commodity which relies on very cheap clear felling techniques to get itself to market. And it's at the very bottom end of the market, so it, it gets used in China for the formwork around concrete poured for construction of motorways, and it comes back to New Zealand as you know, container crates around our TV sets. So part of the answer to this is to uh, energise uh, forestry as a value-added uh, sector and for sheep and beef farmers to then access that new uh, technology for producing a much more high value uh, kind of land use than you have offering to you from radiata pine people at the moment. Quite a lot of research is being done overseas because of our GM ban. This trial work is being done overseas on how can we make radiata pine grow faster, uh, stronger, and produce a more valuable product. Could we? do a little bit of a genetic engineering that translated some of the qualities of kauri into a radiata pine so that you had that very high strength, high prestige timber which also grew faster. And these are some of the possibilities out there and I don't think you should look at them as a kind of forestry, as a kind of blight on the landscape. There's huge potential in forestry just as there is in farming and this is all about innovation, unlocking it getting rid of some of the prejudices that stop us from doing some of these things. I, I, think, there's a, I think there's great opportunities out there. Sorry, Roland, we're going to have to keep going. This. Yep. Uh, sorry, question. Uh, it's just Say who you are. Uh, Dan Shand, uh, farming at uh, Island Hills, um, sheep and beef and honey. Uh, the question is, a lot of the things that you're talking about, um, we weren't thinking about 20 years ago, but we're actually already doing. What is actually in 20... 20 years time, what is it that we haven't thought about? You know, what's the thing that was painted and patented in 1954 that we're not doing yet? Mm -hmm. So Robin. from an animal perspective, Dan, a lot of that understanding around how to get animals with different attributes in meat and wool, for example, that's some of the, the work that's been patented and has, has not been picked up, particularly in grass-fed animals. And if we're to go to this hyper-personalised future, then I think some of that will be pulled through and you will then have need to have the tools to, to deliver it. That's the challenge. I think we, we know what it looks like, we know the attributes you need to feed them, how are we going to do it in the kind of farming systems, pastoral systems? Well, I think you're right. They, they are happening out there, you're definitely right, but they're still only happening in pockets. It's still the age-old problem of how do you get your neighbour or the guy down the road or the guy the farmer you go to the pub with to come to these things. There's still a lot of people out there with their head in the sands that are not moving forward. As it was always going to happen, we're going to run out of time here. So that, that's going to be the problem, because this is only the start of the conversation. But Boyd here, and then there's two down here too. Sandra? Yeah, yeah Boyd McDonald, sheep and beef farming. Um, look, we're hearing about the change and the mindset change that's required. I totally agree that, that that is what's required. I mean, my question is around leadership. Um, where are we going to see this leadership for our industry come from? Or are we facing regulation before the change is going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Winston Chris, Peters, it's obvious. 
And Robin, that gives you Robin, it gives you a couple of minutes to think about what Chris answers. It. Yeah, it's thirty it, seconds actually. It's the whole it's the hole in the room. We're busy being farmers. Um, we need professional people to step up. So whether we get a, a quasi brains board of which a guy Samon sits on as well, we need everyone in that sort of governance role to actually talk the vision and then we've got to take it out without being a talk fest. Bloody hard, but I know what you're saying, Boyd. It's right through our whole industry. It's interesting if I put my science hat on now because we have not seen very much investment in Hill Country research in the last 20 years and we don't have science leadership in Hill Country to a great extent at all. And to me that's another real challenge we've got because we need science leadership coming alongside to produce the kind of results you guys need going forward. You've got leaders, it's how the leaders actually, it's the goal that we need these leaders to deliver to. Yeah, good answer. Edmund Noonan, Christchurch. Could I ask the panel please why they believe that in 20, 30, 40 years time that we will still be harvesting livestock from our whole country, that it's not politically or community deemed barbaric and that we shouldn't do it anymore? Ooh. Good question. You'll have to ask the millennials this question, but um, <laughs> because the fact Who's is... Under 38? Yep, the fact is that, you know, I can sit here and give my opinion, but it is, as they said, the customer of tomorrow, the majority of them are going to be millennials and they will eat, they will eat bite-sized God knows what. So it's a very valid question. And, and unless we can position, the only reason we're going to be doing it is if our meat is positioned to being healthy, health attributes, everything we've espoused this morning, um, to a high-paying person, that is, it is a treat to eat it. That's the only way we're going to make that work. Does it scare you, Chris? Yep, it does. I heard Rosie Belton, Bosworth Belton last year, Bosworth last year, and you could have dropped a pin in this room and everything she said is moving and moving quite fast. So it does scare me. Uh, if I was sitting on a board now, if I wasn't in a partnership with Jackie, she, she's been asking me this question, but one of my due diligences would be, would I, would I invest in hill country farming? I would seriously have to have to put a different hat on in the present space and time. I think we can get there if we take the opportunities. Sam and Beef and Lamb and our meat companies and our marketing have to help us get there. And it, I'm throwing it, I see Mr Graham there. So. But, but I think it's a serious, serious risk. And I think I would be buying more land out on the flat at present with water in it because it's got options. Where does it leave our industry? That's what we're here today to ask. Guy Simon just wants to comment on that too. And then we've got time for one more I'm question. just going to really quickly say, as the mother of teenage boys, I don't see a future where the young male is not going to have a really strong desire for red meat. At least a small enough proportion of them globally, a small enough proportion of them globally to consume the kind of meat we produce. I think, we, I think the human is by, by uh, genetic development and omnivore and I think we will ha continue to have people that will want to eat it. I completely agree there'll be a lot of people who will choose not to but I think there'll be a drive there to eat it. So my answer to this question is that it really depends a lot on you folk yourselves. This is not a black and white question, are we going to eat meat or are we all going to be vegans? The, que the real issue is how do we do the farming in a way which meets society's sensitivities and objectives. And if I may just drop this in, you know, at this stage, I worry about winter feeding practices. Because when I drive around the South Island at this time of year, I see a lot of animals, you know, up to their bellies in mud. And I know that animals like to be able to lie down. They don't want to be stuck in a paddock for weeks when, you know, they can't lie down. There's nowhere to lie down. Um, I know as a you know, person worried about greenhouse gas emissions that nitrous oxide is a huge part of the problem, the biggest part of the problem I think from farming, and it comes from uh, urine deposited on wet soil during the winter. Um, and, uh, and then there's a sediment and water quality issue as well. So if I was saying what is the one big thing that everyone in livestock farming on hill country could do that would make a difference to each of those three problem areas, uh, changing winter feeding practices is the number one thing that I'd focus on. 
Hi, Lauren Wilson, Shepherd out at West Melton. My question is, everyone's talking about involving young people and them being the future, but what have we got in place to involve these people? Well, I thought this one might get directed to me. Um, so it's interesting you say that. So when I knew I was coming here, I asked our young shepherd, um, you know, what he thought things would be like in 2040, and he gave me the predicted answers. And then I, when I asked him what he was going to do to secure his future, he told me he probably, would, probably wouldn't be farming. You know, this is a young man that has a, you know, a firm hold on his goals and how he wants to get there and an understanding of what he needs to do to do it. And I just thought that's really disappointing. So I've thought about this a lot. Um, you know, when I started farming at the age of, you know, 19 or something, I was paid $18,500 a year. Um, the average house price in New Zealand was $150,000. Today, a young person starting out could probably expect to earn no, early 30s, 35,000. The average house price in New Zealand is $500,000. This is a systemic problem through the whole country in every industry, but I believe we drag the chain. So I think you need to attract these people in the door. Like It's an exciting industry, but you don't just need them in the industry, you need them on your farm going forward, don't you? So I think that is a really be a really good start. You know, get them in the door, attract them with money. I haven't met many people that don't like money. Is there anyone in the audience that knows what an answer to that question? What's going on at the moment in terms of as a young person? Is there any? Because that's that's one of the key issues actually. Relation to that question? Yep. Oh, sorry. Make some wise statement. I mean, I think the first thing you need to do is involve them in your business. Um, I'm Tony Plunkett. I'm from Coleridge Downs. We've actually just started up a, a cadet school up there. Been running a couple of years. We're finding there's a heap of young, passionate kids out there. We're having an open day on Sunday. We're expecting 60 kids to turn up. We've only got room for three. Hmm. So, uh, as much as I hear that that, that 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 they're not there, they are there, and they're very, very passionate, and hmm. they want to be part of our industry and they want to be there for the long term. So I think we've just got to treat them better and, and as the panel is saying, you've got to offer them opportunities. Mm. They all want to, they, they run the properties like they own, so they want some sort of ownership, that's a big thing they want and they want to be appreciated and they love agriculture. Great. We're going to close it off there because when we did this, I said we need two hours. We'll get another hour next year, I'm sure. But can I just try and summarise? I mean, and I'm not going to do justice to it, so we've probably... But there's some common themes. And I thought we started off, Guy talked about we need to deliver on the values we share, which is an interesting comment. We share across everyone, not just farmers, but New Zealanders share. How do we deliver on those values? There's a lot of discussion about consolidation and different models that were around partnerships. Again, that was actually sharing, collaboration, and the skills. How do we get skills to share? How do we move up the value chain? I think almost that was a given with the panel members. It wasn't about being, we won't be there for the commodity game. Technology, but I thought technology to build trust with our consumers, but also with our communities. And I thought that was a different angle on technology. I thought it was really good. The youngest and the brightest brains, and how do we give them things like profit shares? How do we develop them as people? They're not just a worker. They're a key person in our business. A whole lot of opportunities were discussed, renewable energy, carbon, bioproducts from the hill. I thought that's, that to me really sticks, vodka. Natural fibres to take the place of plastics. Um, Hyper-personalised meat products. But again, we had that discussion about making sure that we're meeting the needs of our consumers. They've got issues about um, where their meat comes from. One perfect hectare. How do you make 100,000 EBIT? That wasn't mentioned, but that was my figure in my head. 100,000 EBIT off one perfect hectare. Yeah, twice that off Kiwi Twice that, yeah, well perhaps 300,000 off the one perfect hectare. How do we leverage money from our view, which was a, a different way of thinking. So a lot of opportunities. A common theme was focus on our customer, differentiate from our competitors. We've got to have a point of difference. And I often think of business, how do you keep building moats around your business? So you defend your business, it's unique. How do we build brands? How do we tell our story better? Um, how do we be, make sure we're profitable? So making sure your lens is on profit by doing the right things. And I thought another common theme was how do we be proactive? 
and this is my interpretation, but I actually think as farmers we've lost our mojo a bit. We actually are sitting back and waiting for someone else to tell us what to do. How do we become entrepreneurs again? And how do we drive the change that's required? So actually just interesting, last month I was involved with, and there's a couple of people in this room were too, for, th for two days we did this exercise with 30 arable farmers. And we um, looked at what the vision was in 2040. And we came up with the most exciting list of things that our farms could look like and opportunities. And at the end, people were buzzing, they were energised, like I hope you all are here. And, you know, they were really excited about the future. And we said to them, well, what's the key thing that's holding you back from realising this vision? And I was quite surprised in the answer, because the answer was self-belief and personal confidence. They weren't worried about the minor issues about funding and, um, uh, you know, collaboration and how they'd go about doing that. It was actually about themselves, personally. And so change is really scary, and I think we've got to accept that. This is stepping out of your comfort zone to drive to the vision of the future. And that's not easy. And one of my favourite quotes, actually, from a course I went on with a gentleman in the back of the room, but was, for things to change, first I must change. So it all starts with us as individuals and our mindset and our attitudes. So if you want to create a new reality with a new, with a new business model, I think you need to adapt a new mindset and a new vision and potentially build a new team around you that can help you drive to that successful future. So the opportunities are really there. It's up to, I believe, how we grab hold of them and how we make them a reality. So can you join with me in thanking these four panellists? Because... I think it's a real hallmark of leadership that you're prepared to stand in front of your peers and actually articulate your vision and say how you see the world because it actually inspires and it challenges us. But I'd also like to thank you all for coming along, being prepared. I don't think anyone left before it. But I think this will be just hopefully a bit like having a thistle in your sock for the next week. As you walk around, I hope this is going to really irritate you about whether you're doing the right thing for the future. And it will make you think about what you can do differently in your business going forward. So good luck.